In today's episode, we're working on the E24 LT1. And guess what we're gonna be doing? We are going to be getting that engine installed into this car. But there's a lot more things that we still need to do, final preparation stuff that a lot of people don't think about before we get this drivetrain in the car. You don't just install an engine and be done with it, especially with a V8 engine like this. There's a lot you still need to do, a lot of fine-tuned things that need to be installed because if you install this engine before installing these tiny little things, you'll never be able to reach a tool to get to those tiny little things to even install it. So there is an order of operations. I said that in the last video. So guys, thanks for watching this video. Hopefully you enjoy the playlist and please tell your friends. Okay, now back to work. As you can see, we fixed our flapper mechanism here. Basically, it comes in and out when there's, you know, air flow. So we have our HVAC unit, which is fully functional and completed. We have this guy that needs to get installed up into there. And, uh, and then we have to make all of our electrical connections, which should actually be pretty simple. So I'm gonna bring this down and make things a little bit easier for me. And I'm gonna install. So the HVC unit is now installed. As you can see, I had to make my own little bracket there that holds it in place. And I also wanna make sure that the condensation line that goes down through the transmission tunnel down and below actually is a place to relieve the condensation. So that is all lined up and ready to go. So we're in good shape there. I also had installed the, con the uh, air conditioning lines. And one of the really nifty thing in putting this together that I really wanted to share with you guys is what's called the auto wrench. Now this is a automatically, it's battery powered and it automatically sizes to whatever your, um, your crescent wrench size is on any application. And it has markings on it. I don't know if you can see the markings here. The markings on that side are um, the inch side and this is metric on the other side. And basically all you need to do is just put it in place and you press the button and it'll automatically fit it to whatever the size is. You can either not care about the size or you can do what I did, which is basically fit it to the size and then look to see, oh, looks like it's 17 millimeter. So I grab my 17 millimeter and I know exactly what size it is. And it saves me, it saves me trips back and forth to the, to the, to the toolbox. But this thing is really, really cool for any size. Uh, anywhere you want to go, you don't really need to, uh, and in a tight spot where you have to constantly adjust, this is a pretty cool thing uh, to have in your tool arsenal. So now we're organizing the interior a little bit. This is just kind of giving you a taste of what we're gonna end up doing in a couple of future episodes. But for now, I just wanna get most of the interior back together. The scary part about this is that I have never seen this car function at all. Um, not even with a battery. I received it without an engine, so a lot of that is kind of like all up for grabs still as to whether or not it's going to work when I put everything back together. Now I've identified most of where these connectors go. I think this is a couple here that I need to figure out. But for the most part, I think I'm in really good shape here. I do need to attach these two pieces together. I need to install that assembly into here. Everything's gonna start to fit into place. But what I'd like to do is just do that and then I wanna do the, uh, the seat adjustment as well. So there's a lot of things that need to go uh, pre-assemble before you get everything completely assembled. But um, I'm slowly and, sh and surely making headway here. So there you go. Look at this. Looks absolutely gorgeous. Check it out from this side. This is what an E24 carpet should look like. Everything's hooked up though. We still have a few more things to do, including wiring up the reverse lights for the back of the car through the reverse switch on the TR6060. We also need to cut out the, uh, the accelerator pedal because there's a new location down here for where the pedal mounts. So we need to cut a little bit more of the carpet away and get that exposed and install it. 
plug it in. We need to wire up the clutch switch from up here. As you can see, this is the clutch switch from the uh, LT1. We need to wire it to these three wires that I have going into the DME. We need to put in our kick panel and stuff like that, but I won't want to do all that stuff until we, you know, start getting the car started and I can play around with the pedals and start moving things around and adjusting uh, the brake pedal light switch and all that stuff. So everything needs to be adjusted. But we got some really cool stuff here in terms of seats coming up for you in the next couple of episodes. The interior for now is done to my standard and we need to come back to this. We're gonna do some cool stuff with the front seats as well. Um, and that includes replacing a bolster and making sure that all the functions work and dyeing everything. These rear seats, as a clue, not staying. <laughs> Now that we got the inside stuff done, and I'm glad that that's behind me, had nothing to do with the LT1 install, admittedly, but I wanted to just do it because it was been on my mind and I just wanted to get it out of the way and not think about it anymore. Now we're coming back to the things that are needed to get the LT1 TR6060 installed into this E24, and that is to do a little bit more preventative maintenance. This clutch, this pressure plate, and this throwout bearing are going to be near impossible to replace without removing the entire drivetrain. So we wanna do it now as a precautionary replacement. This car had 56,000 miles on it before it was replaced, before it was re uh, wrecked. And we have no clue of knowing whether or not the clutch was you know, abused or whether or not those were easy miles or hard miles. Um, and I don't wanna take that chance. A new clutch flywheel setup is about 600 bucks and my client is perfectly fine with doing that as a preventative maintenance as opposed to doing it later on down the road if we find out that the clutch slips on our first drive, we are gonna be in big trouble. I don't wanna take that chance and neither does he. So we're just gonna be doing a quick replacement of the clutch and the pressure plate and the throwout bearing. As you can see, the flywheel looks really good here, actually. Um, the machining marks are still on here, no hot spots. So I think that this, for 54,000 miles, actually looks pretty good. You can see all of that, um, all the, the clutch, um, you know, the filings and the dust and everything. But overall, this looks pretty good. Um, the clutch disc is not nearly close to the rivets yet, so this has a little bit of life left in it, but better to do it now than later, I don't care. I really like this clutch centering mechanism here that you see, that basically sits inside of the pressure plate assembly, and that helps to center the clutch when you install the transmission, as opposed to BMW using, you know, a, a centering tool that goes into the pilot bearing. It's actually pretty slick how they did that, and the throwout bearing is even simpler. I mean, this whole throwout bearing, um, you know, slave cylinder assembly is pretty pretty nifty. It's held in by two 10 millimeter screws, M6s. And you know, you can see it just kind of screws in there and that kind of goes through. Let's get the, uh, the um, skip shift kit installed into there right there and I'll show you how that works as well. And, uh, and then this uh, whole assembly should be ready for install. So what I have in my hand here is called the skip shift kit. And basically it skips second and third gear in order to save fuel economy. So when you're shifting from first down into second, it actually prevents you and locks you out of second and third gear and goes directly into fourth. So you go from first down to fourth. It's to save fuel economy. And my customer is performance minded. And I think that he should have the right to choose whether or not he goes into second gear or not. So I say let him choose. So basically what this kit is, um, it is uh, basically a jumper wire that connects into the harness that tricks the ECM to thinking that that solenoid that is right, located right here is actually there when it's not. So that way you don't get any error codes and it doesn't lock you out of second and third gear when you want to shift hard. What this kit is, is basically a 37 ohm resistor half watt that plugs into that, tricks the ECM. The other side, in many cases, what you can do is you can leave the sensor there and you can just plug it up with a fake plug that has no wires to it. Basically plugs right into there for most people who want to do a quick and easy wiring swap only, you can do that. In my case, since I have limited space in the transmission tunnel, I bought a plug both parts are down in the description you can take a look at. But basically the plug just kind of screws into here and you can um, easily block that out and save yourself a little bit of room in the transmission tunnel. So let's drain the TR6060 and fill it up with some AMSOIL. Um, AMSOIL is a really, really good uh, automatic transmission fluid that's gonna be used in this case, uh, in this manual transmission. It's got all of the friction modifiers, it's got everything that you need. So we're gonna do a quick flush on this guy. You can see that the drain is right here. It just takes a 3 8 inch. And then the fill is on the other side, on the driver's side, and that's right here. Basically, you want to fill to this line, and once it starts dribbling out the bottom, you know you filled it up. It's about 3.6 quarts. 
So this stuff is called Amsoil Torque Drive and it's really, really good stuff. Not cheap and it's specially formulated to work with these TR6060 transmissions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use what's called a fluid transfer pump. We're gonna put be putting about 3.65 liters of fluid or whatever pours out of the fill hole first. And all you have to do is just suck and blow. Well, it looked like it gobbled up most of the entire gallon actually without having, without coming out of the, the spout here. It is kind of coming out a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is, I think that's enough. It's just about three, 3.7, 3.8. There's still a little bit left in here. So I'm just gonna close this guy up. Now we've received our new clutch fly, uh, pressure plate and clutch disc. As you can see, this is the new one and that's the old one. The, um, the differences between the two are very, very, very slight in terms of the wear. Again, I think I stand by my previous statement that this clutch was not worn, um, not abused. It was actually in very good condition, but we are replacing it with a brand new one anyway, just to eliminate any X factor here when we install the drivetrain. So let's just take this guy and let's put it on, let's install, and let's install the six M10 screws and uh, torque them down. Happy to report that the new throw up bearing slash slave cylinder has arrived. There was really nothing wrong with this one. It's really just more of a precautionary replacement. This is again the bleed line. So we need to install the bleed line before we reinstall the entire assembly into here and then fish everything out through the backside. Now that the TR6060 is back on, we've got our bleed lines, we've got our clutch lines, everything is installed. This is ready to go, back in the car. There's one other very important thing I wanted to distinguish before um, we put this drivetrain in and I needed to explain it to you. And that is this coolant passage outlet. Now this passage actually goes down and into the old existing oil pan oil cooler. The oil cooler was right, actually right on the oil pan. There was no external cooler that was sitting in front of the engine for airflow. It was actually attached to the old oil pan. Since we went to a Holly oil pan, which is a slimmer fit, we actually need to plug this up now. So this guy actually is just sitting in here with a little circlip and we welded this, we crimped it and welded it closed so that the coolant does not flow anywhere. And if you forget to do that, you're gonna fill this up with coolant and it's gonna start pouring out. So I'm really glad we were able to do that and I wanted to let you guys know for the LT1, that is an absolute must. Or you can use this coolant and tap it into the return from the radiator for an additional coolant reservoir, uh, okay, coolant um, uh, radiator if you wanted to somewhere around here. It'd be good to have that too. So you can actually use it if you wanted to, but in this case, we're not. So one thing we absolutely have to install before we install the entire drivetrain is the clutch hard line. Now the clutch hard line is gonna be coming out of the master cylinder. As you can see, we have our reservoir right here and that's coming down into the master cylinder to fill it up and then it comes out of the master cylinder output into this hard line. This hard line gets installed just like this and it comes down and it snakes down into this which is a bracket that I had created in order to install the AN10 line. Now the AN10 line is essentially just going to come in like that or oh, I'm sorry AN4 line rather and that just snakes in just like that. We tighten this, we tighten that, and then this is a clip in order to affix this guy just like that. Just hit it in place with a hammer, and this guy is going nowhere. So the uh, entire assembly is going to be pretty easy to install. At which point, we're going to take our AN4 stainless steel line, plug it right in there after the drive drivetrain is installed, and this guy will have already been snaked around the transmission tunnel and go right into the slave cylinder. So these are the heater whore, the heater whore. <laughs> these are the heater whore hoses. These are the heater core hoses that came from the Chevy Camaro and they install directly onto the LT1 right here. There's an input and then there's an output and they both go installed just like this. 
Very easy. And the reason I'm keeping these hoses is not only because they have this awesome bend already integrated, but because they also have the heat shielding already integrated. So what that means is that I have two heater core hoses right here that have the same 5 8 inch diameter, inner diameter, that need to snake around and they need to go around here and they need to go into the heater core itself um, on the E24. So I have tons of hose here. This is all 5 8 hose, so I have enough hose to make it work. And I also have these two pieces of hose that I'm going to end up using on the firewall. Let's take a look at that real quick. So this, these are the two hoses that are going to end up going along the firewall. And both of these hoses are going to sneak along the firewall. We're going to use a couple of 5 8 barbs, and that's going to have those other two hoses go and sneak around, just like this. And it's going to go right around to the two hoses that are on the LT1. So a real quick tip that's helped me out a lot when trying to wrangle up a lot of hoses and getting them to look organized is to easily do this with two zip ties. The first zip tie goes around both hoses like you see here. Keep it loose. And the second zip tie goes around the first zip tie just like this. If you want to get these hoses sitting in a, perfect, in a specific location or specific manner, this is an excellent technique in order to really clean up your wires or your plumbing. So as we're contemplating the brake lines, we're trying to consider everything else that the brake lines also interact with. And that includes the fuel line and the clutch line and the steering column. So we're gonna have four brake lines coming out from where that ABS pump is. Those four lines are gonna be coming out and going to each of the individual wheels. The front left is easy, goes right through here. The front right is actually quite easy because that comes up, around, down, and through there. So that's going to be pretty easy too. It's the two rears. So the two rears are going to end up getting uh, snaked around with the other two. It's going to go in front of the, uh, um, the brace for the wheel well and they're going to be going into here. And into here are going to be the two locations for the, the reducers for the brakes. So each uh, wheel has its own individual one. And we're going to be making a bracket that's going to be bolting to this and, and these holes here are going to be used to mount it together. The clutch line seems to be unaffected. The fuel line has now been routed. As you can see, there's no interference on the fuel line that's going to go straight into the engine. Remember, this is a deadhead system, so there is going to be no return. And the steering column will end up going snaked up through here and into the steering column without any interference or obstruction. So it seems like this is going to be a bit of a complicated looking area, but I'm going to try making it as easy and serviceable as possible. Um, and you'll see that there's going to have nice, nice new brake lines that are going to be routed all the way through. It's going to look pretty slick when it's done. For this E24 LT1, we have four brake lines coming out of the ABS pump and going to their respective wheels. Now, the ABS pump is labeled H for Hinton and V for Vorn. Uh, Hinton means rear, Vorn means front, and then it's HRHL, which is Hinton rear, uh, Hinton right, and then Hinton left. So you can pretty much know exactly which output from the ABS pump goes to which wheel. In this case, we're making our own brake lines that are going to be going to each of the individual rears today. So we have both of our brake lines and I already bent one. As you can see that I've already got a nice 90 degree angle on this guy and I wanted to explain how to do it on this one. Now when you bend, you always want to put your brake line fitting in this position and always hug it up against your bubble flare. When you do that, you take your brake line bender and you want to make sure that this is already pushed up against your flare and like this, just like that. Make sure that it's before your bend because if you do it after, you will never, you will never ever be able to get your fitting around that bend and back to the, the flare where you need it. So then you just squeeze the trigger, trigger or the handle, and you just made your 90 degree bend with no kinks and your fitting is right in there. So let's put these two puppies back on. As you can see here, I made the 90 degree bends at different heights and that's to allow for one to go underneath the other in this manner if I absolutely require it. So I want to label one to be the left one, one to be the right one, and they're both going to go toward the rear of the car. Our VL and VR, those are the two for the front, right here, and HL is there. So basically these two are the ones I need to tap into. 
the one with the larger 90 degree angle is going to go in the rear and uh, the one with the smaller 90 degree angle that I made is going to go right on this one instead. So we've got our rear adjuster bracket completed and the way that this works is it essentially just sits right on here and it screws right in there like that. And from there, the other two guys get installed directly onto the exposed nuts. And that holds everything in place for the two lines to go straight down into. So what we've got to do now is size and terminate our two brake lines that go to the two rear tires. see all those brake lines coming from the ABS pump over through the wheel well housing and into its respective location here. It is very tight here, not very tight. It's maybe about a quarter inch between the steering column and these, but they everything is stationary. Nothing is going to move here. The steering column will move in and out, but that's it. All the other brake lines are going to their respective locations. As you can see here, this guy has been bent down and around and over and is supported in three different places from here, actually, this is the fourth place it's supported. One, two, three, and four. And coming out of the wheel wells, you'll see right here on the passenger side, we have to terminate that to the, to the stainless steel brake line that you see right there. And on the driver's side is the same story, but this is a lot longer. We're gonna need to trim that down and terminate it over to this stainless steel brake line. Factory locations, we're gonna need to clean this up significantly, so we'll do that as well. <laughs> Body ground, uber clean before we install because it won't be the easiest to get access to and clean later. I think we have everything done in the engine bay and on the drive line in order to get this thing to install. Now in the past, what I've typically done was done a, uh, a time lapse and I don't want to do a time lapse here because I want to show you without using any words how to install this drive line into here. And it's not that difficult and it can be done with one man. So I do have Dan behind the camera to help me with the recording while we give you only the, uh, the necessary tips and tricks on how to install something like this. And yes, it does come from the bottom up. It does not install from the top down because there is no co removable core support. And in that case, what we're gonna do is uh, just kind of get right on into it. Here we go. So the whole drivetrain is now in, and this is the most exciting part of the entire build, is to see what this thing actually looks like. And we don't have our boot yet, but we will very soon. I wanted to see how it would shift into all the gears. Check it out. First, second, third, 
fourth, fifth, sixth, reverse. So there you have it guys, the LT1 is now installed, fully ready to go. Now that everything is in, we need to start installing all of our ancillary and supporting accessories like heater hoses, AC, our wiring, grounding, DME, uh, everything else. Essentially everything else on this side, that's only half of it, right? The other half is all the way over there, which we need to work on as well. But guys, thank you so much for watching the E24 LT1 build. My name is Frank Macaluso. We are just a few videos away from finishing this build completely. Um, and uh, please contact me or comment if you have any questions or concerns. Fuck, so stupid. Questions or concerns? Questions or concerns? Uh, you can run it back. All right, I will. Uh, my director is telling me to just go with the flow here. Um, so here I am uh, signing off, saying, hey, what the heck are we going to be doing in the next episode? I don't really know yet, but uh, just uh, stand by because it's probably going to be something good. <laughs>